At times, we all feel lost in search of something more. This is Christina Dam, and this is the Liberate the Podcast, a podcast designed to help inspire and guide you forward through everything spirituality, creativity, art, and just giving you a sense of empowerment so that you can be powerful, be magical, and be free. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Liberate the Podcast. Today, we're welcoming founder and author of Holy Shit, We're Alive. And his name is Doug Courtright. And we're going to be talking about the a psychedelic journey towards self-love and healing. Very interesting, timely topic. And I think that that's uh, the premise of what your book's about is really your journey, right? Am I correct here? Yeah, it's got a bunch of twists and turns and just kind of all the different lives that I live or all the, the masks, I guess you could say, that I used to wear. Oh, I love it. So yeah. let's, uh, you know, do we want to start talking about this particular subject or more on your book or maybe how you even were, I mean, maybe your first psychedelic experience. I mean, where, yeah. where do you want to start? Yeah, I, I would love to dive into the first psychedelic experience. I think a little bit of a background, a little bit of a foundation will help the listeners kind of understand to kind of build it up. But, um, I, uh, I grew up in Salt Lake city, Utah. Okay. And uh, born and raised there, loved my childhood. And growing up in Utah, I was raised a Mormon. Okay. And so I was a member of the LDS faith. And uh, growing up in Utah, I kind of did everything that I was supposed to do. You know, when, you, when you're raised in a bubble, especially in Mormonism or any, you know, intense religious experience, you don't know you're in a bubble when you're growing up because it's just mm -hmm. like all you know. Yeah. And so um, it's your reality. my reality. <laughs> it's just reality. It's just what it is. And so I kind of, you're kind of told what to do. So especially in church. So it's like, you know, be a good person and follow the rules of the church. And, and then in my family life, it was, you know, get good grades. Eventually you want to go to college. And in Mormonism, you have this big coming of age ritual when you're 19, where you go on a mission, a service mission. And so mm -hmm. you get a mission call in for two years you go, you get your a call anywhere in the world. And all you do for the next two years of your life is you 100% focus on missionary work. So mm -hmm. you're not reading, you're not listening to music, you're not watching TV, you're not, you don't have a cell phone, you can only email your family once a week. And it's just really intensive, you know, experience. It's a really coming of age ritual. Okay. Um, and so growing up, you're kind of leading up to this experience when you're 19. And so I, uh, I would got good grades and I was captain of my football team and I was, you know, did service in my community and, but all, all the way leading up to it, I didn't realize the effect of this until later, but I grew up as the fat kid. So I was okay. overweight. Right. And so I believed that something was wrong with me that I was broken. And like, when I would meet people, like I can't hide my body. And so I knew that you looked down upon me or this was the story I was telling mm -hmm. in my head that you looked down upon me. And now I have to overcompensate and prove myself to you because I'm not enough as I am. Mm. And so that was like the underlying foundation of my whole belief system is I have to prove myself to everybody yeah, because I'm the fat kid and I don't belong. And you can see that. And you're looking down upon me and you're judging me and you're, and I'm not worthy of, of love and acceptance. And so that was kind of the foundation. So by overcompensating in that, I, you know, became captain of the football team in my high school and went to a good college and got good grades, hoping that I could get some validation. And so as I've grown older, I've learned that we all have stories about that. Yeah. Like everyone has a story about why they're not enough. And uh, so that was kind of my, my flow up until my mission of like trying to gain validation and get self-approval. Um, which is a really exhausting way to live for sure. Um, and then I went and did my Mormon mission. And, and so where'd you, you, where'd you go in the world? I know. I actually went to uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Have you been to New Zealand? I have not, but it yeah. sounds, sounds like an amazing, like very different place than Utah, right? Very different place than Utah. And, um, What's fascinating about my Mormon mission is that I actually got sent home early. I got kicked off my mission. Oh, wow. How, I know. how soon into it? So nine months in, I got sent home. And um, so before you go, 
there's like this standard of worthiness that you have to abide by. So like no coffee, no, definitely no alcohol, like no girls, no pornography, no intimacy, you know, for at least six months before you go, because you want to have like a pure soul and be in alignment and be, you know, in a place to preach God's gospel. And so got my Mormon mission call. I was so stoked and all my friends were getting their mission calls. I get New Zealand. So I'm like, feeling like superior to them. I got the coolest one. And, um, I had a girlfriend before I left. And so my time comes, I I think I got my actual mission call in November and I had to report to the training facility in February. So I had a couple of months. So Uh leading up to it, I was, I was following the rules. I was doing everything I was supposed to. And I like had my big farewell party because I'm about to leave. And I said goodbye to everyone. And I had my bags packed and I wasn't enrolled in school. And I went to go say goodbye to my girlfriend the night before I left and being a 19 year old male with your (laughs) girlfriend and you're not going to see her for two years. What do you think we did? Yeah. Yeah. We slipped up, you know? And so I broke the rules and I remember because I had this image of myself of having to have everything together and proving myself that there was no way I could come clean the night before I left. Yeah. Cause think of the shame and the guilt and the embarrassment that would have to go with that. Right. And so I didn't tell anyone and I swept it under the rug and then I went out onto my mission. So, and I was trying to fake it, but like the shame and the guilt of feeling like I had lied was building and building and building to eventually nine months into my mission, I came clean and told my mission president and they sent me home. Wow. And got kicked off my mission. And then I had to go deal with that shame and guilt of being sent home and the religious shame that God was mad at me Mm. and the frustration of that. So now I'm dealing with fat kid story. I'm not lovable. And now God's mad at me. And what's really fascinating about the story is when I got home, my dad got diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so he only had about a year to live. And so now I'm dealing with losing my father and wow. watching like so him. much stacked up, yeah. but like almost from like a higher spiritual per- perspective, it was like you got sent home so you could spend that year with him. Cause otherwise you wouldn't even got that time. Totally. Right. right? And so it's so, so interesting how it works out and, and, you know, all of this is kind of building and building. And so I got to say goodbye to my dad and then he passed away and, you know, being raised in that religious household of having to have it all together and do what's right by God, you know, we're never taught, especially as men, how to address our feelings and how to address grief and how to address, address sadness. And so here I am, you know, having really God shame that I got sent for my mission. And then my dad just died. And so I don't know how to deal with that. And so I needed to find a distraction to bury these emotions I didn't want to feel. And, you know, so often than not, we deal with really heavy emotions in our life and we find ways to mask them or distract us or cover it up. And, you know, a lot of people use substances and whatnot, but I decided to go with work and I buried myself with work. And I found, it was really interesting. I got recruited to work at the sales company when I was 19 or I was 20 years old at the time. And it was a hundred percent sales commission and it was in door to door sales. And we sold alarm systems door to door. Oh, wow. Like it, like an ADT security yeah. system. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. It was called Vivint, V I V I N T. It's the biggest ADT's biggest rival. And so I, I had like this aha moment realizing that I could make kind of uncapped commissions. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy shit, I can just like, make as much as I want. And that was like this new concept for me when I was 20 years old. Cause it's like, you're taught to like, go get a, go to school and get your, do your internship and then go work your way up the corporate ladder. It's kind of like yeah. the path that's laid for you. And I'm like, wait, I can go make how much and how soon? Like if I just work really hard and I and had the all these emotions, I work, the more I make, you know, like exactly. Yeah. And that was really empowering for me. And 
more so than that too, though, it was like, oh, I can go hide my body shame. I can go hide my religious shame. I can go hide my grief. And I'm going to go become 100% obsessed with this career. Mm. And so I did all the sales training. I went to all the masterminds. I did all of the seminars and I would stay up till YouTube till three in the morning watching sales training and then practice. And then I'd record myself. And then, you know, I became obsessed. And those next seven years of my life, I just made insane money for my age. And I remember when I was 24, I'd made a million dollars. Wow. And I thought that that was going to solve all my problems. It's like, okay, I don't know how to deal with this grief. I don't know how to deal with this shame. I don't know how to deal with this insecurity. So I'll go buy cars and watches and trips and date pretty yeah. women. And, and hopefully that'll solve all of these problems. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're trying to solve the, the inside wound with the outside never feels it just right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And this, this, my story is not unique. You hear this story all the time, you know, of like money doesn't buy you happiness and things like that. And I'm not the first to go through this experience, but you know, I had to go through it myself. And then, so I kind of hit this, this, this void. And as you know, leading up to the first cycle experience, it's, it's a term that I've, I term in my book called the success void. Mm. And the success point was if I were to give you a resume of my life, um, it would look successful car trip, money, women experiences, but there was such a deep void inside of me. And so it was actually a really scary time in my life, um, leading up to this because what my mentors were encouraging me to do were like, go make more money. And I'm like, "Mm, I don't think that's the answer. They're like, go grow your business, you know? to fill that void. I'm like, I don't think that's it. Um, and then I decided, you know what, none of this money stuff is working. So I'm going to go look left and maybe peek down the rabbit hole and try something else and see where this lands me. So that was, you know, things really started to change when there was actually a defining moments, a couple of defining moments, but here I am, I'm 27 years old. I'm this toxic sales masculine bro who drives a Mercedes and thinks he's really cool and did a lot of CrossFit, you know, like get mm-hmm. really strong, you know, be a CrossFit buff guy. And um, where things started to change was my sister, my twin sister gave me a book called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. I'm sure you know that one, right? It's a classic. Yeah. Absolute classic. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to give this universe stuff a shot. You know, I have nothing to lose. And then one day after CrossFit, my CrossFit coach invited me to go to a yoga class with her after. And I'm like, yoga? No, that's for woo-woo hippies. I don't need to do yoga. She's like, no, 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 it'll be good. I'm like, no, I'm not going to go to yoga. Like, I'm not weird. And uh, she, she said something. She goes, it'll help you with CrossFit because you'll be more flexible. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, if it yeah. helped me lift more, then I'll go. <laughs> And so I go to this yoga class with her one night and, um, it was a restorative class. So it was like candles and really like Zen music. And then we get to Shavasana at the end. I've never done Shavasana. And, you know, it's kind of like your muscles are all stretched out and you kind of just lay on the ground. It's almost meditative state. And I remember my mind got really quiet in my first Shavasana. And I was like, what the hell is this? (laughs) <laughs> like, <laughs> this is so nice. And I feel like my mind hadn't stopped talking for like seven years. Yeah. And this was the first time that my mind quieted. And I'm like, whoa, this is incredible. And so I remember really feeling the pull and the draw to yoga and meditation. And my personality is I'm very impulsive and I go all in. So the next day, I go to Lululemon and buy the newest yoga mat and all the new shorts and all the things. I'm like, I'm going to go all in on yoga. And yoga was really good to kind of tap in. There was the first time I felt a, like a, a flow connection with my own body and my mm-hmm. spirit. Right. Cause before my, my relationship with my body was a, I hated myself because I was fat and B like, if I have, if I want my body to look good, I have to like grind and beat it up and do the crossover workouts. And I had to like, hate myself into a new body, which didn't work. Yeah. And so the yoga is working really, really well. We're flowing. And then I got invited to go to 
a yoga retreat in Costa Rica. Okay. That my friend was hosting. And I have this experience, right? So I fly into Costa Rica. Oh, and on that note, so I get invited to go to this, this, the story is a lot longer and it's more fun if you want to read the book. But anyways, I get to, I get to Costa Rica to go to this yoga retreat. And I find out before I go that the people going to this yoga retreat, there was like 14 single girls in their early twenties. And I was the only single guy. <laughs> There's a couple of married couples that went and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like bachelor. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm going to have, this is going to be incredible. Like, yeah. You're like tropical this is scenery. Dream. Um, anyone's dream come true. So I was stoked. I'm jazzed to go to this yoga retreat. And there's actually a girl that I was seeing a few months earlier was going as well. So I'm like, oh, I've already got one in the bag. Like I've already got a girl that I've got a good flow with. So like, this is incredible. And then I went to Costa Rica and it was something happened when I landed there that I couldn't really pinpoint, but I was just, I was in a really deep flow. And looking back, I could tell I was, I really had like dropped into a, uh, like a vortex in a sense. And one of the nights we got there, um, we did a restorative class again, like watching the sunrise or the sunset over the beach and like this on this pad up top. And it was beautiful. And when we finished the class, the sun was completely down and we were looking under the, the stars and it was a new moon. So like you couldn't see the moon and the stars were just insane. And I remember in this deep meditative posture, my, my body like started to vibrate and I felt like I was mm. floating and I felt like I was floating and I'm like, what is going on? And so I turn around and I see my own body on the ground. And I panicked. I'm like, wait, what, what the hell is this? And I like kind of slapped back in my body and I'm like, I just have an out of body experience. And I'm like, I must've been dreaming. And I didn't tell anyone about it because I thought that it was, it wasn't real. Mm. And I got, I got really scared and nervous and my heart was beating so fast. And I was like, didn't really understand what was going on. I hadn't really studied much Eastern philosophy and like this weird flows going on. And so I get home and I'm journaling about it and kind of didn't really know how to sit with that. And then two weeks later, I am on a sales training trip in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm about to leave and I get an email from Audible. And it's just like, hey, these are the top new releases. Audible's the program that we listen to audiobooks, right? We all know yeah. Audible. And uh, there's a book that came out that week that was a top seller called Stealing Fire. And are you familiar with that book? I haven't read that one. Yeah. So Stealing Fire is by Jamie Wheel and Stephen Collar. And the premise is how to get into flow state. Okay. So flow state is like when you're just in the zone, whether you're an athlete or a musician or an artist, and it's just happening. Like you're doing yeah. really deep work and you lose track of time and you're just in the zone. So I'm reading that book thinking, oh, okay, how can this help my sales career? So I get to a part in the book where they talk about psychedelics and growing up as like this kind of toxic Mormon sales bro. You're taught that all drugs are basically meth or heroin. And if you do them one time, you'll become addicted and then you'll become homeless and then you'll die. Like yeah. that's just, that's what it is. And so I'm reading this book, Stealing Fire, and they're talking about the therapeutic benefits of psychedelic healing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like my jaw is dropped and specifically in the book, they talk about LSD. They talk about psilocybin mushrooms. They talk about DMT and ayahuasca, and they talk about MDMA and how it works, how a lot of vets are taking uh, MDMA to help with PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I'm literally like blown away at what I'm reading. And f I remember feeling in my, in my gut, I'm like, there's something here. And things really changed because they talk about in that book that there's a quote from Steve Jobs, who, you know, being a young business guy, like Steve Jobs is like the Mecca of, you know, idols. Yeah. And he has a quote where he says, you know, doing LSD was one of the most profound experiences of my life. And I'm like, wait, here's this guy that like literally changed the world that we all have as products. And he's talking a bit about psychedelics in a positive tone. Mm -hmm. I'm like there is something going on over here. And so I'm reading that book. I'm blown away. 
two weeks later, um, I was supposed to be working in an out of state, but for whatever reason I was in town in Utah, I had a buddy call me. It was a Saturday night. He calls me and he goes, Hey, um, there's a cabin happening. There's a party happening up in Eden, Utah. And have you ever been to Eden? No. So it's this beautiful area up in, in Utah. It's in the mountains and there's this incredible lake and it's just like total picturesque mountain vibe. And he's like, Hey, our friend's having a, a, a party up at his cabin. You should come up with us. I'm like, cool. Totally. So I don't think anything's going on. I'll probably have a couple drinks, you know, whatever house party, whatever. So I get to this cabin and I see a friend that I hadn't seen since high school. And he just says, Hey, Doug, good to see you. Not sure if you're into any of this, but I have some MDMA here if you want some. Hmm. And I'm like, no shit. I'm like, I've never been offered this in my life. And I ever. just read about it. <laughs> and I read about this two weeks ago. And I'm like, I remember feeling like, oh, I have to try this. Like, I just have to go see how this goes. So I don't know. Are you, are you familiar with MDMA? Of course. Of course. Right. So I'm like, shit, I'm going to take MDMA. So I take this MDMA. It's a press pill. Right. Um, I think it had a, like an Ikea logo on it. And I take this pill and, you know, 45 minutes later, it kicks it, right? And so I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. I love everyone. Like, give me a back massage, turn off the lights, turn on, you know, turn on the EDM music and just vibe, right? Yeah. And so I'm having my first, you know, MDMA experience and I'm just full of love and light and it's all great. And it's amazing. But I have this moment. We're probably like, I'm definitely a peaked. I'm definitely rolling. And um, I have this moment where I'm like, okay, this is great. And this is cool. And like, I love my friends and like, I feel more open, but I'm like, well, I'm not like meeting God. Like this isn't changing. This isn't like some yeah. deep spiritual experience that, you know, like, and I was thinking back to the book. I'm like, I was, you know, people have these moments where they feel like one with God. I'm like, I don't feel, I feel happy with my friends and I feel full of love, but like, this isn't a spiritual experience by any means. And so as I'm kind of just like normally rolling, kind of having a normal night, my friend's like, Hey, come into the master bedroom. We're going to turn off all the lights. We have like this glow stick thing and we're going to turn on dead mouse really loud and you're going to love it. I'm like, cool, let's do it. Whatever. So we do like this little laser show, what if, whatever, we're just doing drugs and um, someone comes in and like, messes up the vibe, hits the light and everyone kind of like scatters out and then someone turns off light. So I remember I'm in this bedroom by myself and I'm laying on the hardwood floor and I'll never forget. I have my hands behind my head. And I remember thinking there's more here. Like there's another level of this. Like there's, there's something else going on here. So I get up to stand up to leave this bedroom. And I have this moment of like, Oh shit. Like I need help. I need help right now. And I start to panic and I start to fall behind my body like I did in Costa Rica. So I've out of body experience again. And wow. I like froze in time. And I was like, oh shit, I'm dead. Like I've died in it. And like all of these memories, it was insane. All of these memories from when I was a little boy started to come back into my mind. And I'm like, oh, like your life flashes before your eyes. I'm like, oh shit, I'm dead. Like I've literally died and I was getting these really weird memories when I was like three years old playing in my old house. And I'm like, they're going to have to tell my mom that I took drugs at a party and died. Like, and then all of a sudden it was like, Woof! and I like slapped back into my body. And there was like this ringing, this like, wow, wow, like really intense. And I'm like, what just happened? And like, all of my fear was gone. And I opened up the bedroom door to go back into the party and I don't know how to explain this, but the best words I can use was I was in like the spirit realm. Like I was in the higher dimension and it wasn't a hallucination where I had my eyes closed. It was literally happening. Everything was way more enhanced. Everyone had like these light systems that went up them and I, they were breathing these energy off of them. And it was, everyone had different colors. Wow. And I'm like, holy shit. Like my first thought is like, this is what happens when you do drugs. How come no one talks about this? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like in a totally different dimension. And I'm like looking around and I'm like, oh my gosh, we finally made it. Like we finally got to the spirit world. Like we've been working our whole lives to get here and we finally made it. 
And, and like I said, in my head, I thought this is what happens every single time you did this. I'm like, why yeah. is this no, like, this happened this to you? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how do people not talk about this all the time? This is the most incredible experience ever. And I could see energy waves in the sky, like in the air. Mm-hmm. And I would go and look at like anything that had ever been alive. So like the table, there's a wood table in the kitchen. And I remember I could see the energy still in the wood. You enjoying this so far? Did you forget to subscribe? Make sure to do so. It takes two seconds. Just press that little button, the red one, you know, the one, just press it, little like. All right, enjoy the rest of this content. Amazing. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I walk out onto the balcony and I over uh, the overlooks the lake and I could see the lake and I saw mother earth's soul breathing. And I'm like, Oh, mother earth. I get it. It's an actual living, breathing entity. Here I am as this toxic sales bro before didn't get mother earth. And I'm like, Oh, I get it. I get I get her. I can see her. I can feel her. And so I then go walk back inside. And all of a sudden this like beam of light socks me on the top of the head, this like rips on me. And it was the love of the creator. And it was the most indescribable, immense, loving, beautiful energy that I've ever felt my entire life. And up to that point, you know, if your happiness scale on a one to 10, think of the happiest, most beautiful moment of your whole life. That's a 10, right? This is a 25. There's a whole nother scale that I don't even know what's possible to feel love and connection. And so I go to my friend who gave me the pill. I'm like, thank you so much. Like I'll never be the same. And then I start to kind of realize that I'm having a different experience than other people. Mm. And I'm like, wait, no one else is here with me. So then I decide to go off into a room and lay down. And then I start hallucinating. Like I close my eyes and I have these really intense envisions. And I met like this spirit guide, like this really tall, lanky, who wasn't scary, but he was just showing me, you know, how I'm not saying this is true, by the way. I'm not saying that I know have the answers, but the way I interpreted this vision was I saw kind of what happened before we came to earth and we were in Mm -hmm. like this general's tent and we all have these agreements with each other of like, okay, I'm going to teach you this. And then you're going to teach me this. And then I'm going to meet you at this point in my life. And then we're going to create this. And Mm -hmm. it was very, like very orchestrated, like to the T, like very intentional. Then it was like ready break. And then after there's like this review process that isn't, I say review process because I don't want to use the word judgment because it's not, you're not judged. It was just kind of like, let's break it down what happened. It wasn't good or bad or right or wrong. It was like, let's just break down the learning in a sense. Mm -hmm. And then when you, when you're done, you have opportunity to relive earth as many times as you need. And then when you graduate, you go to different experiences. And I see the spirit guide and I'm looking under this huge dome and there's a million stars in the sky. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of stars here. He goes, no, those aren't stars. He goes, those are other experiences that aren't human. Mm. And when you graduate earth, when you finish earth, you just continue your evolution. Wow. And I was like, holy shit. And then it kind of just like ended and I like was sober. And so I go back to my buddy. I'm like, dude, thank you so much. It's like, yeah, man, I'm glad you're having fun. I'm like, no, like, thank you. (laughs) It's like, yeah. I'm like, I'm I'm sober. And he's like, no, you're not. You took that like three hours ago. It lasts like six hours up. And I'm like, I was totally fine. So I just, I just went home. And then the next morning I called my buddy and my buddy that night before it was his first time too. He he took, he had his very first experience too with MDMA. So I called him. I'm like, Hey dude, what did you learn in the spirit world? And he's like, what? (laughs) I'm like, yeah, when you broke through, into that other dimension, what did you learn? And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, what happened to you last night? He's like, yeah, I took MDMA for the first time and I felt really, really good. And I had like the best cuddle sesh with my wife and we just talked about how great our lives are. Hmm. He's like, what happened to you? I'm like, dude, I went to another dimension and saw the purpose of life. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, what are you talking about? And so 
it's kind of funny to say in this moment, but in the moment for me, it was actually incredibly scary because here I was like totally not conscious, not aware. And then having this really, really intense experience. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've messed my brain up. Like they're going to have to put me in a psych ward. Yeah. Like I can't deny what just happened. That was the most real experience I've ever had in my life. It's more real than this is real. Yeah. Like that dimension is more real than normal waking life. And I cannot deny that. And I'm like, I'm, they're going to put me in a psych institute. And so I get onto Reddit and I start Googling MDMA trip reports and whatnot. I'm not finding anything like mine, except for when I start dabbling into like DMT ayahuasca realm, people mm -hmm. are similar. And I'm like, what, like what happened last night? And so two weeks later, I'm in, I, so on, on that note, I didn't sleep. I slept with my light on for the next like 30 days, just completely freaked out. I'm like, okay, like spirits and energy are real. I cannot deny that I've seen it and I don't know what's going on. Everything is up for interpretation. Yeah. And totally unhinged. Like this is freaking scary. So two weeks later, um, I'm on a yoga retreat again with my friends and one of my best friends, Bea is with me. I'm like, Bea, I have to tell you this story. Like, you're not going to believe what happened to me. So I started explaining the story. So rewind real quick to my Mormon mission. So when I was in New Zealand before I got south home and when I was on my Mormon mission, I had a reoccurring dream it happened a couple of times. And in my dream, I'm looking through like a glass door and on a counter is I see a white birthday cake. Okay. And I kept thinking in my dream, like, what are we celebrating? Whose birthday is it? Like, what's going on? And before I wake up, I zoom in and on the white birthday cake in red frosting, it just says June 10th. And so on my Mormon mission, I kept thinking, okay, something really cool is going to happen on June 10th, yada, yada, yada. Anyways, June 10th came and go on my mission. Nothing happened. So back to yoga retreat, talking to my friend Bea. Luckily, while I was having that experience, when I was in the high, higher dimension, my other friend who was sober took a video recording of me and just said, hey, what's going on for you right now? So I'm like, Bea, I have a video. I'm going to show you what happened. She's like, amazing. So the first time I pull up my phone, I click on the video and I see the timestamp on the bottom. June 10th. And I'm like, no way. Wow. No way. And that moment was really important to me because that was such a coincidence, like such an incredible synchronicity that I'm like, okay, something's going on here. Like, mm -hmm. and so I got re-engaged rather than being scared of what was happening. I'm like, okay, let me engage with what's going on happening now at a deeper level. So I doubled down on the book, Stealing Fire. I'm like, okay, I'm going to reread Stealing Fire and I'm going to sign up for all their email lists. I'm going to join their community, whatever. Shortly after I joined their community, I get an email blast from them that says, Hey, due to the success of the book, stealing fire, right. We're going to hold a flow camp. We'll get together. Oh, wow. We'll talk about movement and getting in flow. And we'll talk about psychedelics and all of that things. I'm like, Oh, this is perfect for me right now. We're going to hold it in Eden, Utah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? And so I apply to go spend another 5,000 bucks. I'm the only person from Utah that even goes. There's people from out of the country, from all over the country or out of the, all over the, all over the world inside the country. And so I go to this flow camp thing and I'm complete fish out of water. Like a month ago, two months earlier, I was like this sales trainer, bro. And now I'm like talking with all of these flow state mystical people. And I'm just like, what is going on? I'm so uncomfortable. And I remember it was during the, uh, the eclipse in 2017. Okay. And so we're up in the mountains during the eclipse. And there was this one woman, I remember like, she didn't like have her armpit shaved or something. And she was like, Hey, what's your rising moon sign? I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, you don't know your rising moon sign during the eclipse. And I'm like, where am I? Like, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> And I was like, I got to get out of here. So I'm like, I'm going home. This is too much. This is too woo woo. I'm not ready for this. And um, I'm like, I'm going to stay one more night. And bad speakers come up. And one of the speakers came up and her name's uh, Kristen. And she's this incredible flow coach. And she wrote a book called The Art of Fear. And she talks about how not to suppress your emotions, which really resonated with me because I knew I'd suppressed a lot of stuff throughout my life. 
And afterwards, we're leaving like the, the campsite and we're walking to our tents and she's walking right next to me. And I have this strong, intuitive voice hit me that says, you came here to meet her. Hmm. So I lean in. I'm like, hey, you know, thanks for your chat. I loved it. And I'm like, where do you live? She's like, oh, I live in Salt Lake City. I'm like, oh, I live in Salt Lake City. I'm like, what do you do? She's like, well, I'm a, I coach people. I'm, I help people navigate their, you know, their awakening. And I'm like, I need to hire you right now. Like you're my new coach. <laughs> so, um, I work with Kristen and Kristen was really, really important to me because she really brought me down to earth and grounded me. Mm-hmm. And she's like, she said something to me. that I'll never forget. She said, Hey, don't freak out. You're waking up. That's okay. It's actually really exciting. This is only going to happen once in your life. So you need to like kind of pay attention to what's going on and go into yeah. the flow. So I tell her my, my June 10th story and she's so excited. She's like, that is crazy. I've never heard of that happening on MDMA. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. So she's like, Hey, stay awake to the synchronicities of life yeah. and trust the flow. So I'm like, okay. So she's like, if there's a movie you want to see, watch the movie. If there's a book you want to read, watch the book. And around that time is when the, uh, the movie Blade Runner has come out. I don't know if you've okay. seen the new one that came out a couple of years ago, but that movie comes out and basically the premise of the movie it, it really shortly is Ryan Gosling is a Blade Runner and there's a, a company that created artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And what happened is that AI then turned on that company and started killing humans. Yeah. So another company created Blade Runners to kill the first batch of AI. Ryan Gosling is a Blade Runner and his job is to kill AI. You can't tell who's a Blade Runner or who's AI and who's not. It's humans because mm-hmm. they look the same. So beginning of the movie, Gosling has this mission. He takes care of these AI. But while he's at the house, he, he sees that the two artificial intelligence actually had a baby. And he's like, oh, shit, if word gets out, the AI can reproduce. It's over. Like human humanity is over. And then he goes out onto the tree. There's a tree in the front yard and the baby's birth date is carved into the tree. What do you think the birthday was? June 10th. June 10th. So I'm like, that wasn't like this big aha crazy moment, but I'm like, okay, pay but attention. You're There's being something. aware yeah. and you're seeing yeah. these things that are validating and pointing you in certain directions. Yeah. So I like in the theater, I'm like watching it like this. And then I like lean forward. I'm like, Hmm, what's going on? What's going on here? I'm really paying attention. And then it gets to a part in the movie where Ryan Gosling thinks he might be that baby. Cause he has these memories of a kid of the childhood. And he knows that his memories aren't real, that they were implanted into his brain to make him feel like a human. So he goes, if I can prove that my memories actually did happen, then that means that I had a childhood and I've had a childhood that I'm this baby. So he goes to the company that made him and he goes to the memory maker is her name. She's the woman who's in charge of putting memories into people's heads. And he goes to her and just asks her, he goes, how do I know if my memories are real or not? And she goes, it's based upon how you feel. And she's like, let me show you how I do it. So she creates a fake memory, a scene. Mm -hmm. And the scene she uses, the first thing that pops up is a white birthday cake with red frosting, which is exactly the same cake I saw in my dream. Wow. So I'm like, oh my gosh. It's the first time in my life that I actually gasped. I had a real gasp. So I take this information back to Kristen. I'm like, Kristen, I don't know if I'm losing my mind or what's going on. (laughs) And then she just said, I think you're ready for ayahuasca. Mm Mm-hmm. And with Kristen's help, I had my first, you know, maybe three weeks later, I had my first ever ayahuasca session and that's not that changed everything. So the build up to the ayahuasca was really, really powerful. And my first MBMA experience was really intense. And as I'm sure you're very aware, ayahuasca is just a whole nother beast to get mm-hmm. into those deep nooks and crannies. And so that was my introduction to plant medicine. Wow. And so, I mean, it literally like shifted everything about you. You had, you, you know, changed your whole life, right? For the most part or how you perceive the world. Yeah. June 10th, 2017. So I have like one of these night sky things right here. Uh I don't know if you see those. That's June 10th, 2017. Yeah. So So cool. That, that night, 9.35 PM, June 10th, 2017, my entire life shifted and has never been the same since. Wow. 
And what are some yeah. um, profound changes that happened, you know, because, I mean, you kept on saying that for the people that are listening, you kept on saying, you know, I, I used to be the sales bro and this, this. And so, like, what mm. things shifted in your physical life? Yeah, everything. So I changed my entire diet and exercise routine and started eating way a lot healthier um, and lost, you know, I think after ayahuasca, I think I lost like 30 pounds right after. And I've easily wow. been able to keep that off just because my, the way I viewed myself completely changed. I learned mm -hmm. to love myself and love my body and be grateful for my body and want to treat it right because I respect it. Yeah. Right. So I want to give it healthy foods. I want to hydrate. I want to move because I love and respect my body. Um, and then I shifted careers. I left my high paying sales job and started my company, The Daily Shifts, which is a personal development and mindfulness um, app for busy people. Um, okay. And because really where that stemmed was, so after my ayahuasca experiences, I really took a sabbatical, about an 18 month sabbatical, where I traveled all over the world and met with spiritual gurus and psychologists and did the find yourself in Bali thing and, you know, did all of that. And I had this, and you know, a lot of burning man, and I had this aha moment where it was a lot of people, especially in my old industry, need this help. Like they need yeah. healing. They need to reconnect. They need mindfulness. But the current way it's being presented, it's unapproachable. It's just like yeah. weird, hippy dippy, woo woo. That's not their thing. And so yeah, I'm well, like, I mean, how look at when you went to that retreat you almost left had you not stayed one more night because even though you had that profound experience and you signed up for it yourself it was a little too off putting for you it, it was a disconnect right where you couldn't grab a hold of it because it seems so far from where you were you need that like building block for people exactly exactly so i'm like okay how can i repurpose some of this information and present it in a way where it doesn't feel intimidating yeah and the building block. So that's what sparked me to start the daily shifts. And, you know, the app has seen really, really good success. And so now I work with people one on one and I have online programs and coach uh, uh, master classes and workbooks and all that. And so it's like, how can I bring, you know, how can I be that building block to bridge these two worlds? Because I think they work hand in hand. And, yeah. you know, you see people that are really, really type A you know, grind, 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 have no connection to spirituality in their life. And then you see the people that are so spiritual where all they want to do is meditate in a cave the rest of their life. And that doesn't work either because we yeah. live in the modern world. And so how do we merge these two worlds together? And especially, you know, working with men who may be in toxic sales cultures or whatnot to bring these together. And so that sparked, you know, my, my change as well. So you know, when you say what changed from that, I would say everything of where I live, what I do for work, how I make my money, my community, my friends, my network, my physical health, my relationships. I mean, it's truly been, you know, the most, most important decision I ever made in my entire life was to take that pill on June 10th, 2017. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah. And he had such a profound experience. I mean, it was meant to happen because like so many people have told you in the past, you know, MDMA normally doesn't give people those type of experiences yeah. you know it makes you feel happy it yeah. alters you know it, it opens your heart but it's not really by nature any type of hallucinogenic yeah totally and i you know it's actually because um i feel like with maps and rick doblin mm -hmm. yeah so i asked him this question because i was like you know i'm like i did not have a typical i've done mdma a, a lot more I mean, not a lot, I've probably done it maybe seven or eight times since that experience. And I've had nothing even remotely close to that night. Yeah. And in my head, I'm like, why did I have such an intense experience? And I think the reality is, and this is just the story I'm telling myself for it to make sense, but is I was so asleep at the wheel. I was mm -hmm. so far that I needed to have a grand, incredible experience to like wake me up. I yeah. needed to get shot out of a cannon to continue my path. Cause I think if I would have had a normal MDMA night, I'd been like, okay, that's amazing and great, but it wouldn't, I wouldn't have kept going down the path that eventually led me to healing with ayahuasca. Yeah, no, cause you probably would have walked away, might not have been 
drawn to read that book again. Been mm -hmm. like, ah, you know, it was great, but I don't really need that. That wasn't, you know. Right. But yeah. you had such a profound, and you're like, if that does it, what else is out there? Yeah. <laughs> what else happens, you know? What's Especially going on? Especially having those conversations with people, and like your friend that had did it for the first time too, have not have that experience. I think that was also a profound thing for you, is that realizing that you had something that you experienced that was different than the norm too. Mm -hmm. Totally. It definitely kept me on the path. And that is, I'm probably not on this podcast with you if I didn't have that. I mean, I wouldn't be because I wouldn't have written yeah. my book and, you know, wouldn't have started my company. And you know, that, that one night changed forever, changed me forever. No, oh, it's, it's, it's amazing. So tell people a little bit more about, about your app and what benefits it has for them. And, you know, let's, let's promote that. Yeah, the app is, is amazing. It's really simple, easy to use mindfulness. And so we start you off really slow and it's very, like I said, it's mindfulness for busy people. Yeah. So there's breathing exercises, there's meditation, there's a gratitude area, there's goal setting, you know, where, what direction you want to head in your life. There's empathy practices as well. There's intent, you know, what I call recess, which is one of my favorite things where it's keeping you accountable for having fun every single day. And there's That's these great. really little quick tidbits know, multiple shifts, the daily shifts, multiple shifts throughout the day, just to bring you back to center, you know, because life is really busy. And like, and I yeah. don't care how spiritual you are, or how amazing you think, you know, your practices, we still have normal life, whether that's kids and job, and you can't predict life, it's going to be up and down, you can be busy and frustrated. So how do we bring in these simple practices, these simple shifts to bring you back to calm? And yeah. it's very simple. It's very fast. So meditations, you know, so meditations are designed to be five minutes or less mm -hmm. and just that quick moment of breath just to bring you back so in the yeah. morning in the afternoon and in the evening and it's all encompassed with gratitude so oh, expressing beautiful. expressing gratitude for yourself appreciation for yourself for your life for the, the loved ones those you care about and really having that foundation of gratitude when you practice these shifts really helps you you know, I always say it slows everything down and puts mm -hmm. you back in control and helps you live, live your life in a more guided state. And so well, I it see a lot you of success. Your heart, you know, yeah. like it gets you out of the monkey mind and says, OK, because a feeling of gratitude is a feeling. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and so when you're in that space, you're pulled down and then you're present because you're in your body, you're in your emotions, you're in you. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And, and people need that. People need short and simple, easy to use that is approachable, you know, yeah. um, and that just leads them down a further path. So it's a beautiful thing of what you created and sharing yeah, your you. story and sharing your story so authentically and being able to tap into so many different types of subcultures of, of people through that journey, you know. Um, whether it was somebody that was really into a very, you know, organized religion growing up or somebody that was feeling lost or somebody that had lower self-confidence and esteem due to any type of bullying or body mm. dysmorphia type of feelings or whatever the case may be. But like you tap into all of that with such authenticity to share that I think it's relatable to so many people. Thank you. Yeah. And my goal isn't to take you all the way down the path. My, my goal is just to tap you on the shoulder and show you that there's another way. Yeah. Look over and here. <laughs> just look over here. Just, just look that way. And then however far you want to go, you go, go. But I just want to guide people and just show them there's another door. Yeah. It's kind of like the book that when you read and yeah. the flow state and how it kind of opened your window and you're like, Hmm. And then that guided what? you down the another door. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, it's been, it's been great. It's been really exciting and there's a lot of changes happening in our company and it's, we're growing and it's, I think the, the market and the world is ready for it. And so yeah. it's, uh, it's been really exciting to be a part of it. And I know your book is available on Amazon, so people can grab mm -hmm. that. Do you have an audible version too? Yeah. So my brother is a professional voice actor okay. and he does a lot of voiceover work for commercials and cartoons and video games. And so my brother reads it and he does an incredible job. And, uh, yeah, it's available on audible. And oh, yes. So you got yeah. the audible back to the audible connection and you had it yeah. on Amazon and your app, both available and Android and, uh, for iOS. 
It's on iOS. Android's coming soon. We're in the process okay. of building the, the Android version, but the Apple version is up and cranking. And yeah, it's been really such a joy. And I just, I just, get, I'm so when anytime I'm feeling down with myself, I go and read my Apple reviews Aww. and or my book reviews, and just to see the impact it's making helps me, you know, appreciate cultivate that gratitude. Yeah, well, that's that's part of, you know, the journey, right? As we go mm -hmm. through experiences so that we can share our experiences and hope that we can affect and change other people's lives. Yeah. Aw. Doug, where can people find you? I gave them yes. all the ways that they can find your products, but where can they find yeah. you? Cool. Yeah, so I'm I'm most active on Instagram at Doug underscore Cartwright. Okay. And I answer all my, I answer all my DMs. So. Okay. If you have a DM, you have a question about, you know, whatever you're going through right now, I love chatting with people. I'm not like this massive, crazy, insane influencer. Like I've got capacity and I love chatting with people that are going through similar experiences because uh, it it's, feels like my kind of role and responsibility in life is to help people along their path as well. So. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. If you left people with one thing, what would it be? My favorite line that I share with people, they're like, give me a quick hit. And I always say, loosen the reins. Mm. And too often we hold on to life so tight. We want to look a specific way. We are, we're craving for a specific outcome and specific results. And we suffer when they don't come the way we want them to. So if you just yeah. loosen the reins, let go, let life take you in any direction, in my experience, it always turns out better than I could have predicted myself. Beautiful. I love it. And the synchronicity part, too. Mm. Loosen the rays and pay attention, right? Pay attention. Life is trying to engage with us. It's trying to teach us something. If we can get out of our own way and see the dots connect, it uh, makes for a fun adventure. I love it. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure, Doug. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll have everything up and, uh, and about. And thank you for joining. Please, if people are listening to this and you liked it, please share. Uh, we have some uh, shorter um, clips that are in YouTube that you can also grab a hold of and share on any of your platforms. Uh, but like and comment because it helps our algorithms. So thank you so much. And until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like it, subscribe, and share it with your friends. If you want to hear more about what we have going on and happening online or in, in the neighborhood, check out liberateyourself.com and sign up for our mailing list. Uh, also, follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Liberate Yourself. It's you are self, U R S E L F. Until next time, be powerful, be magical, and be free.